car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with host David Lamb and the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. A really interesting topic of conversation that will impact many of us at one time or another. A topic of conversation that we think you're going to be interested in. So we'll, I'll introduce you to our guests coming up in just a bit uh, who are going to lead this conversation. But a couple of reminders. I just want to make sure we got the ground rules in place. First of all, at the bottom of your screen all throughout the show tonight, you'll see ways you can be a part of the conversation. Call, text, email, whatever you prefer. Uh, that information at the bottom of your screen. And don't forget, Hollis Wright makes available attorneys each and every time we're on the air. So every Sunday night, attorneys from Hollis Wright are standing by live. That's a free off air and confidential conversation that is yours for the taking. So for the next half hour, you've got that opportunity to take advantage of it. Leading our conversation, Michael Eldridge from Hollis. Right, good to see you, good sir. Good to see you, David. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I've been doing good. Just had a little baby girl, so not getting a lot of sleep. How uh, old is the baby girl now? She's about a month old, and then I've got a three-year-old that's just running around breaking so stuff. Your, so your house is wide open. That's right. But um, uh, um, but I'm sure a whole lot of fun. Though. It's been a whole lot of fun. Yeah. And we yeah. got a, a fun topic tonight that is not about young children. Yeah, so elder rights and this is a, a subject matter that I know a lot of viewers really are interested in. It affects yeah. us all. Well, we're all we all know someone who's old and yeah. we we know people who are elderly. We have family members and uh, I don't know if you know this, we're going to get old one day too. Uh, I'm there. And I appreciate you saying that. Right. Uh, <laughs> but um, there is a there is a, a a niche section of the law that deals specifically with um, elder rights and elder abuse and um, it's it's pretty complicated, it's pretty nuanced, and not even all, not all attorneys really know how to navigate through it. So we have uh, Jennifer Tombrella here from the Tombrella Law Firm to uh, walk us through it. We appreciate you being here. Yes, thank you for having me back. Um, and tell our viewers a little bit about your practice, a little bit about what you do. Sure, I am, uh, I have a solo small firm located in Bluff Park, uh, right in the middle of Hoover, and I have been there almost eight years now. Um, and so I focus mainly on family law and probate slash, um, you know, elder rights. Okay, well, let's jump right into it. Sure. It, tell us about whether or not these senior citizens, uh, that whether there are laws that give them specific rights and kind of what those are. So over the years, um, there have been, with the baby boomers, there have been a, a very large population of elderly people. Um, and in turn, they have their family members, children, grandchildren taking care of them, um, which is wonderful. But there are certain things that can arise uh, out of there dealing with abuse. Um, so sometimes we have a caretaker that may be a relative, may not be a relative, and um, they have committed abuse against the elderly person. Um, so for purposes of the Elder Abuse Protection Act, you just have to be 60 years of age or older. So we're not talking 70, 80 years, just 60 is the threshold, which is fairly young nowadays. Yeah, it's like, Amen. Like they, <laughs> yeah, yes, that's so young. Yes. So uh, you, you talk about this abuse, obviously the, the older we get, just like Yet when we were younger, when we were children, there was you were certain vulnerabilities and certain protections. The older that we get, um, at least some of us become more prone to these vulnerabilities. Sure. What types of abuse are most common um, that, that you see in your practice that people come to you? And typically, who is it that's coming to you? Is it the elderly person or is it a loved one or, or someone else? So as far as who comes to me, I have seen both. Um, many elderly people have all of their faculties, they are full aware of what's going on and know that they're being abused. And so they themselves can fill out this protection from abuse and get the help that they need. If they are incapacitated, if they are bedridden um, and there's other family members available, somebody else can file it on behalf of the elderly person. Uh, so it does not have to be that person themselves. Um, as far as the types of abuse, we have several different kinds that you may or may not be aware of. Of course, there's the normal physical abuse where right. um, someone has been physically harmed. Um, there is also the threat of physical injury. If, if you're threatened to confine the plaintiff, if you say, I'm not going to let you leave the house, that is that is abuse. Right. So there's also emotional abuse where, where you have them in fear for their life or their safety. Um, and then the, 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 the one that's becoming more and more prevalent is financial abuse where someone who may already have a power of attorney for that elderly person, but is now abusing their power, is using it to transfer properties into their name, is cleaning out bank accounts. So when someone already has that authority and they've already been granted either by the plaintiff or the courts 
um, through a conservatorship or a guardianship. But once they have a document with power in it, what do you do to get them uh, relieved of that power? You know, this is, I'm about to take this show so weird, and I apologize no, in advance. For it. Um, but you talk about older. conservatorship. This whole Britney Spears thing, you know, because she kind of gave over rights and signed, and, and it's so, to the layperson, like, um, it seems it's so obvious, but she kind of signed her rights away. That, is that maybe an example of how difficult it is once you give that away to get that back? It is. Absolutely, absolutely. So once you have a, a court that has approved a guardianship or conservatorship, meaning that they came to court and showed that you cannot handle your affairs, right. you cannot handle your finances, and that they need to step in to do that for you. Yeah. So I'm not sure if Britney Spears yeah, actually remember. signed them yeah. away. I think Me that either. they found her incompetent and then said, well, we have to protect you. Yeah. So we're going to take over. But I think the lesson to everyone is <laughs> be careful when you go into those sort of proceedings absolutely. and make sure you're surrounded by someone like you, you know, that's really looking out for you, yes. you know, yes. uh, that's just a valuable little nugget. And I think that a lawyer, having a lawyer like you on, on my side, that's what I want, sure. you Correct. know, somebody looking out for me. Yes, so. absolutely. Well, you, okay, I'm off Brittany now. You guys, please continue. <laughs> well, you mentioned the Elder, uh, the elder Abuse Protection Act. Um, so let, let's say you are an elderly person has all your faculties and someone is threatening you or trying to take advantage of you financially. What are the steps that you can take um, to protect yourself from this abuse other than calling a lawyer or do you need to call a lawyer immediately? So you absolutely can call a lawyer. Um, many people just feel better, especially if you're going to have to walk into a court of law. You want a, a representative who understands the system and, and knows what's going to happen. Um, you do not have to have an attorney. A lot of times these are emergency situations where we have got to get down there today or right now, get this signed by a judge to get this person. It's effectively a restraining order That's against right. that the defendant, the alleged abuse. User. Okay. So in terms of this petition that you file, where would that be? Would that be, uh, you said a court, but where would they go if they didn't have an attorney? So there are two different places that you can find this form. It is available on the Alicourt website, which is, the website for that is eforms.alicourt.gov. You can look it up. It is form C90, and it is called an Elder Abuse Protection Form. Um, so you can you can either print that or fill it out on your computer, PDF, fill it, and uh, print it out. And then you're going to take that form down to the circuit clerk at the courthouse. And that would be the county that you live in? Correct, of the county that you live in. Um, they also may have some forms there available for you to fill out if you don't have access to a computer or printer. And with the people down there at the clerk's office uh, at the court, at the circuit clerk's office, I mean, would they be familiar with, with what's going on? Is this something that's a common place? Um, that they, they would be able to direct you what you need to do? Well, unfortunately, it's becoming more and more common. Um, so the clerks here in Jefferson County specifically, I just had, uh, uh, we had to do one just a few weeks ago. They were very familiar. Um, you do have to sign it in front of a notary public. That's very important because it is sworn testimony that these acts of abuse are occurring either to you or someone that you know. Um, and so at that point, you will sign it in front of a notary or in front of the court clerk, and then you will actually sit and wait on it. So this is such, um, this is just such an area that there's not a lot of case law on. Um, it hasn't happened as far as the courts are concerned in recent years, um, but you will be able to see a judge. The judge should be able to read over the petition. Um, you know, maybe hear some testimony. You do want to have a little bit of proof or evidence to give the judge um, just to uh, for your position. We've got to step aside our first break of the evening. We're going to step aside real quick as we do so. A reminder about social media. Hollis Wright is all over social media. So wherever you are on social media, I promise they are as well. Just search the term Hollis Wright and you'll find them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. Where you are, they are. Great educational, informational resource there for you. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching The Attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and all fair. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, call, email, or text us. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorney. Attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. When we started the show eight years ago, my hope was we would be able to do what we do best, which is to help people answer real-world legal-related issues they have in their life. People oftentimes are confronting various legal issues and problems in their lives that range across the gamut of legal practice areas. Bankruptcy, criminal law, family law, just to name a few. And to be able to have a 30-minute platform or format to where we can just cover various legal topics once a week uh, that's obviously the primary focus of the show. That we would be able to use the resources of the many lawyers we have at this law firm to create a plan that had a lasting impact that also gave back to the community at the same time. And I think we've done just that with the attorneys. Welcome back in. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. A reminder, attorneys from Hollis Wright, they are standing by live right now. That's a free, off-air, and confidential conversation and opportunity there for you. Let's get back to our conversation about elder rights. A question we've got here. How specific must the petition for elder abuse be? How specific? Uh, does, does that have to be? So the petition will need to be somewhat specific in detailing the types of abuse that occurred, be it financial, um, emotional, or physical. You know, you will just need to state they, they withdrew money from the bank account. They transferred property without anyone's knowledge. They hit and, and caused, you know, the plaintiff injury, right. um, that type of thing. So when you file this petition, what's the next step? What happens? I see you said that you have to go in front of a judge. What, what is the judge or the court actually do and, and when would you go in front of the judge? And you know, anytime we talk about going into a court and talking to a judge, it can be a little scary. Yeah. People get very nervous. They don't know what's going to happen. They're scared they might get in trouble somehow. And that's just not the case. This is a civil, a civil uh, proceeding. It's not criminal in any way, and it's not bringing any criminal charges against the abuser. Um, so uh, after the petition is signed and notarized, the clerk will take it directly to the judge that it's assigned to. The judge will review it, and then we'll call you into the courtroom um, to take your testimony. Sometimes all you have is oral testimony and that's okay but it's always best if we can get some type of proof be it pictures uh, bank statements showing things text messages you know any kind of hard proof that we can show the judge uh, to, to help um, support our position so you, you mentioned that this is a civil proceeding it's not criminal Correct. so I, do I take that to mean that the defendant or whoever you're you're bringing these complaints about would not be there during that hearing to confront you so during the initial hearing, um, when, once you file the petition, you know, that same day and you're waiting to talk to the judge, the defendant will not be present. So after the hearing, if the petition is granted, the judge will sign an order um, preventing that person from being in contact with the elderly. You can also list other people, uh, the spouse of the abused person, their children, uh, maybe the caretaker who's going to be stepping into that role that you're removing the defendant from. So we want to make sure everybody's protected and there are places on that form to write in other people's names. Um, you can also prevent the abuser from going to their place of employment, from being at their house regardless of the ownership of the property. Um, even if that person owns it, we can have them removed temporarily until we can figure out can what's Can I ask you, on. you touched on something that's interesting. So do, do you help folks in the middle of maybe an elder abuse situation as well as it being in the past tense and it happened a year ago, but if someone like right now, I'm concerned for my mom, my dad, my grandparents, do you help folks in the middle of those situations? Because then you may be able to advise them on what kind of things to look for and, 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 and what kind of information to get maybe. Do you help in the middle as well as in the past tense? Yes, sir, absolutely. And it's also important to know that when you're filling out these protection from abuse, we can't be talking about abuse that's occurred in the distant past. It's okay. going to have to be in the recent past. So it's gonna be have to be something that's occurring right now because you're essentially telling the judge, I need an emergency order to stop this person from okay. doing what they are doing right now. Okay. In, in terms of, let's say you, you go before the judge, like you said, they grant the petition, you have what's effectively this temporary restraining order. 
first question is, does it lay out exactly what it's um, prohibiting the person you're complaining about from doing? And let's say they violate that. What is, what's the person's next step? Sure. Um, so, well, the first thing we need to talk about is even though the defendant is not going to be there, they are going to be entitled to service and to have notice of the fact that this proceeding happened. So at some point, they are going to have to be personally served with a copy of the petition and or the order from the judge so that they are aware they are no longer allowed to be in the presence of that person. They're no longer allowed to be at that residence. Uh, their power of attorney has been revoked, whatever the case may be. So they have to actually be put on notice that these things happened. So after the initial order is granted, and you perfect service on that defendant, the judge will hold another hearing, approximately two weeks in the future, um, to where the defendant is able to come and they may speak on their own behalf. They can have an attorney represent them as well. And if they have any defenses or to say that they didn't do these things that they have been accused of, the judge will hear that. They, they will allow a, a trial, so to speak, and some testimony be presented. So one of the things you said, you mentioned earlier, this is a civil proceeding, it's not criminal. Correct. But surely um, there are situations that the two overlap, I would assume, right? If someone comes in and goes through the process that we just described, and they describe or they make complaints that meet the elements of a crime, what does the judge in the civil circuit do in that situation? Or what would the court do in terms of, would they bring uh, the authorities in if they thought a crime had, had occurred in the recent past? So they will not. What the, the circuit civil judge will do is there is a place in the forum that you can mark if there have been criminal charges based on these the incidences that you were alleging. If there are criminal charges, we want to put the judge on notice of that so he's aware that there's going to be a companion criminal case with this. Um, also, the, the, the court is not going to alert the authorities. For you to have charges pressed against someone for this, you're going to have to get a police report filed. So whoever the police, whatever town or city you're in, you're going to want to call them out, make a police report, pick that up, and then you'll take it over to the magistrate. And the magistrate will decide whether or not to press charges. Understood. Um, it, it's, this is, um, um, especially whenever you're helping folks in the middle of things, it, it, it just sounds like it's so stressful, so such a challenge. How often do you... Um, I mean, you, you have a legal mind, I can hear that, but you really almost have to talk folks through some really tough, have some tough conversations and try to set the emotion aside and, and maybe tactically almost, I mean, counsel them and then tactics and then law. I mean, how do you keep it all together whenever you're handling so many, you're spending so many plates? It's, it's all wrapped in together. You know, we have to wear many different hats as attorneys. We right. have to be sensitive. We have to be compassionate to our clients. And we also have to get the facts down. We have to articulate right. them to the judge and we have to get our point across. Yeah, and because sometimes you're in some kind of heartbreaking situation, sounds like. Um, all right, so let's step aside. We're going to take our final break of the evening uh, right here, right now. So one more segment remaining in the attorneys, um, but we're going to step aside real quick and we'll be back with the final segment of the attorneys after this quick break. I'm attorney Bobby Bell with Hollis Wright Law Firm. In today's world, social media is all around us. It is common for many people to post on social media regarding their life and activities on a daily basis. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and similar social media are a great way to stay connected to others and to share your experiences and thoughts. Some seemingly innocent social media posts, however, can have devastating effects if you're involved in litigation, especially in a personal injury claim, a contested divorce, or a child custody battle. Courts regularly allow adverse parties access to the other side's social media accounts, allowing relevant posts to be presented as evidence. These rules have allowed social media to become a hotbed of information in the litigation world. In fact, we are seeing more and more preservation orders issued by courts requiring you to collect and save any and all social media activity. Therefore, it's advisable that even before there's litigation, lawyers should advise their clients that social media content may be discoverable. Here are a few helpful tips. One. Do not post anything about the case. This includes posts regarding conversations or meetings with your attorneys, remarks about your injuries, negative remarks about the opposing party. Do not post anything you would not want read in open court to either a judge or jury. Two, avoid new friend requests from people you do not know. 
Many law firms and insurance offices may attempt to have employees follow you on social media in an attempt to gain information. Three, limit adding new photos, check-ins, photo tagging, etc. Seemingly innocent posts may be used against you. Regular check-ins at restaurants, parties, or other events with friends can cast doubt on any claims of loss of enjoyment of life, pain and suffering, or emotional distress since you appear to be living life as usual. Four, increase your privacy settings. Many social media sites frequently update and change their privacy settings. In the litigation context, it is possible you may have to preserve and present anything you posted. Therefore, we encourage you to be smart and careful when using social media. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching The Attorneys on WETM 13. Welcome back into the attorneys. About seven minutes remaining in the show. So if you want to take advantage of the opportunity to speak with an attorney from Hollis Wright, you got about seven minutes to do so. Um, getting back into this, um, um, talking about elder rights and all of that, I, I think one of the things that hold a lot of people back is is kind of scared of what this is going to cause. This gigantic case. Uh, what what are you, what's the response there? How expensive and from a cost standpoint, what should folks uh, know about this process? So actually to fill out this protection from abuse for the elderly is free. There is no charge to get it filled out and get it filed with the courts. Obviously, if you have an attorney um, accompany you and represent you and help get that testimony out, you'll have to pay any of their fees, but there are no court costs or filing fees associated with this form. So it's not nearly as expensive as probably folks fear it is. Correct. And, and they do that on purpose. They don't want to deter people from coming and filing something that right. when, when they have good. valid okay. arguments. Good. You know, one thing, Jennifer, I, I, you know, I assume you're the same. I get all types of random questions. Um, uh, people call into the law firm, whether we're doing a phone bank or it's just an idle Tuesday. And uh, the question that I get a lot, and I assume you get it more than I do, um, since you deal with elder abuse and elder rights, like we've been talking about today, um, are grandparents wondering whether or not they have a, a legal right to see their grandchildren. and you know, every family is different, but you've got a son-in-law who won't let the daughter-in-law's parents see it, or there's, you know, there's been a death and so-and-so takes custody of the children. Um, what rights, generally or specifically in Alabama, do grandparents have to have visitation rights with their grandchildren? So grandparents do have some rights in the state of Alabama. Um, there's been a lot of cases go before the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court in recent years. Um, but the consensus is, is that based on certain facts and circumstances, grandparents do have a cause of action in either circuit court or probate court to bring an action for grandparent visitation rights for their grandchildren. All right, and there, were there specific circumstances that, that need to apply in order for a, a grandparent to be able to compel a right to visit their grandchildren? That's correct. So if you have two, if, if, if your child is alive, their spouse is alive, and they have just decided that you, they do not want you around and they don't want you to see the grandchildren, there's really not a whole lot you can do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The Constitution says that we have a right to raise our children how we see fit, and if everybody's making the right decisions and you don't want those people around, you don't have to have them around. However, uh, if there has been a death, if, if say you're the grandparent and your child is deceased and your, your in-law is now not letting you see your grandchildren, um, that would be a cause of action in circuit court. Uh, similarly, if there has been an adoption proceeding for that grandchild, either by uh, a step-parent or a, a completely different couple, there is a cause of action in probate court and that will be guided by the probate statute for grandparent visitation. Okay, and then in terms of um, grandparents bringing these actions or determining, I, I would assume that, that, like you said, there are these isolated situations. What about, and I know we were talking about elder abuse, but if there's evidence that whoever has custody of the child, whether it even be your own child as a grandparent, you know, custody of your grandchild, that there's abuse or they're not fit, would that be a circumstance possibly where 
the grandparent has a right to step in? So that would not be so much grandparent visitation as a dependency proceeding. So that would actually, I would recommend that they institute custody papers in juvenile court, alleging that that child is being abused or dependent. And then you can have the juvenile court of that county appoint you as custodian. So you would actually be the caregiver or the primary custodian for those grandchildren if needed. So the, the first circumstances we talked about, that would be more of a probate situation. And then the situation that we just talked about there would be you would go to the family court or the juvenile court about whether or not someone was competent or able Correct. to. So if you were concerned for the safety and welfare of the children, you're going to want to go to juvenile court and ask for full custody, saying that you need these children to be with you so that you can take care of them. Now, as a, it's a different thing talking about grandparent visitation rights, as in I would like to see my grandchild one weekend a month, one week during the summer. That would be what we consider visitation rights, and that is what you can go to circuit court um, if there's been a death uh, of your child or to probate court if there's been an adoption. We only have two minutes remaining, just time enough for a final thought from the, the both of you. Our time has kind of flown by uh, tonight and we've covered a whole lot of ground. But I want to give both of you the opportunity for a final thought. And if you would, you, uh, you go first, Jennifer, please. I would like to tell everybody out there, if you suspect or have any inkling that um, someone you love, an elderly person, is being abused and they either can't speak for themselves or need help in filing a petition and getting to the courthouse to obtain a restraining order, I recommend that you immediately reach out, contact an attorney. They will help guide you through the process. They will help you fill out the paperwork and they will get you in front of that judge and get you that restraining order if needed. Michael, how about you? Yeah, the, my big takeaway here is that obviously, both from a Congress standpoint, from the state, and from our judicial standpoint, that there is a recognition that there are certain people um, that are citizens that are more prone and more vulnerable to abuse. And they have created these laws to protect those people, and that's what they're there for. And uh, what Jennifer touched on is that it's not expensive, mm -hmm. that there are avenues that if you suspect abuse or you're actually being abused and you have your faculties to take to end that abuse, and to restrain those people, whether it be financial, whether it be physical, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it be emotional. And it doesn't necessarily involve the sheriff coming down to your house right. and, and hauling away somebody yeah. um, and, and you going you know, before a criminal judge, that we have these avenues in place to help people who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you are going through that or you suspect that, that you need to explore those avenues. Yeah, um, and oftentimes somebody needs to step up and, and can really be a lifesaver here. Uh, we're out of time, but thank you, uh, thank Jennifer, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it, Michael. Good to see you once again good to see you. as well. Uh, thank you guys for being with us and thank you for being with us as well. We really appreciate the time, each and every uh, opportunity we get to be here with you on Sunday nights. We thank you so much and we'll look for you next time. We'll do this all once again in a week. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.